Hello everyone and welcome. I hope you are doing well. Um, today we are going to be talking about supply chain finance. This is the second lecture of a two-part series and I hope you enjoy it and I hope you learn some interesting facts and um, ways of how supply chain and finance are interconnected. All right, so if we look at the word supply chain finance, um, it is a relatively new term. This term is uh, not one that is commonly known or used. Um, and the thing is that in general, uh, wherever it is, it has been being used, it's been used in a very broad way. And um, if we really look at what it means, uh, we will see that it really is looking at supply chain through a financial lens and identifying the financial impact from supply chain transactions on a company's uh, financial statements, its net profits, its balance sheet, all of those things, its cash flow statements. Um, also, you know, supply chain finance in the past has been known, um, you know, basically just in essence, an understanding of how supply chain is impacting, you know, financial statements. But nowadays, uh, you know, in the recent past, this term has evolved and the meaning has changed. So it has now become a different, it has a different meaning, a much more specific meaning. And what supply chain finance really means is, it is a method to provide liquidity to both buyers and sellers. Um, this is not something that is new uh, per se. Uh, this has been happening for a long time. Uh, you know, there are different ways that buyers try and increase their liquidity position, uh, sellers increase their liquidity position. So that, you know, those practices are not necessarily new, but the term and its meaning, uh, the, the meaning of what supply chain finance means that has evolved and changed. So again, it, whenever we talk about supply chain finance, it is basically we're talking about methods that companies are using to really increase the, their own liquidity. Uh, it depends what you, if you're a buyer or seller in the relationship, but both sides want to increase their liquidity. So let's talk about, you know, we're talking about increasing liquidity. What is liquidity? What is liquidity? So liquidity is the degree to which an asset or security can quickly be bought or sold in a market without affecting the asset's price or the ability to quickly convert assets into cash at value. Um, this, you know, if you have, if a company is liquid, it allows a business to operate, pay bills and buy materials. So imagine you as a person, uh, you know, you may have invested, you decided that, look, you, um, you know, want to invest your money. So you go and you buy a lot of gold, um, you buy, uh, you know, a lot of foreign currency and uh, you put it away you invest it in some bank what happens well if you don't have enough cash on hand uh, meaning you're not in a liquid position that can be very tricky because if you need to buy something you need to pay your own bills for your home you need to buy groceries just to survive you won't have the money so this is a very dangerous situation so generally speaking uh, people do not want that situation to happen. They want to be in a liquid situation. Um, and this has become ever so important in today's day and age. You know, after the whole financial crisis in 2008, which seems to be so long ago, but it was a very, you know, real uh, kind of a shakeup because it led to the first global recession in the world. You know, after that, um, it became very difficult for any company to get cash from the market, just to sort of get loans from the market. And in general, after that time, after 2008, most people, most buyers are, most, you know, the public in by and large wants to make sure that they have 
cash on hand. They have money uh, whenever needed. Uh, and so in general, buyers um, have tried to extend the amount of time they have to make their payments. So let's say a business in, uh, you know, in the olden days had, you know, um, was given 30 days to make a payment. Well, now <clears throat> a lot of companies are negotiating up to 150 days to make payments. Therefore, many suppliers around the world have to wait for a very long time to get paid. Now, this is a problem because those people that are waiting to get paid also need to have cash to pay their own bills while waiting for their invoice payment. So it's kind of like a circular debt kind of a situation um, that is arising because of this. Because if somebody, if you're going to have to wait for 150 days, which is, you know, close to we're looking at, you know, half a year or so to get the payment, well, you also have bills to pay. What are you supposed to do at that time? So this liquidity situation has become a very big issue. And so that's why a lot more emphasis is being placed on it. So um, again, now if we look at supply chain finance definition, you know, especially after we've understood what liquidity means, um, let's 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 dig in a little deeper. So supply chain finance in general is the set of solutions that allows a company to finance its own working capital leverage its role within the supply chain and its relationships with other uh, players in the market. So long story short, um, supply chain finance is basically a way or a set of ways, a set of solutions by which a company can have more liquidity. Okay. And this is what the whole objective of supply chain finance is. And there are many solutions um, that can be used to get that liquidity. In today's lecture, I'll be talking about a couple of them, um, but I do want to mention that there is more than what I have, more solutions than what I will be focusing on in this lecture. Um, so, and if you have questions on that, feel free to reach out to me. I can share um, the additional solutions with you as well. So, um, you know, again, supply chain finance, it, this is providing financing or money to companies for business activities, purchases, or investing. So again, if you have liquidity, you can use it for a number of things, but most importantly, you need liquidity for your business day-to-day -day activities to make purchases, uh, sometimes even to invest, but because let's say there's a fantastic deal in the market, um, you want to have some cash on hand to be able to invest in that. So um, again, if you have the liquidity, you can do a lot of these things. Uh, if, on the other hand, you don't. You have a cash flow situation, a problem. You run out of cash. Well, you cannot function. You may be profitable, but if your cash flow is in negative, you cannot continue your day-to-day -day activities. A um, couple of things to also mention that uh, when we're talking about supply chain financing, uh, there are third parties involved. There are banks and other financial institutions that do get involved. Um, <coughs> it's not uh, necessarily between two parties. Some solutions are between two parties, but generally speaking, supply chain uh, financing involves banks or other financial institutions. <clears throat> and again, supply chain um, uh, financing provides funding capital to, often to consumers and to businesses and supply chain finance or, fun, the, finance or fund their payables, sometimes their inventory. So just to explain that a little further, um, funding or the supply chain finance can be done for sellers or for buyers. Um, their liquidity situation or problem can be on either one of those ends. Um, so that's just something uh, to keep in mind. Now, um, in the supply chain finance first lecture, um, I did talk to you about the cash conversion cycle, also known as the cash to cash conversion cycle. Uh, you know, and we, we did sort of discuss that in general, there are three components in the cash conversion cycle. 
Um, the first one is the cycle time in days to pay your suppliers. How many days do you have to pay your suppliers for whatever you've bought from them? Um, the cycle time, the second um, component is the cycle time to get paid by customers. And obviously, uh, you know, the first one, the time that you want to, that you pay your suppliers, you want that to be as long as possible. The cycle time uh, when your customers pay you, you want this to be as quick as possible. You want them to pay you really, really quickly. And the cycle time to produce and sell a product, this you also want to be, to be fast. Um, if it's slow, you know, your cycle time is really, really slow, then your, your um, money is going to get stuck in the supply chain um, and it's, it's, it's not a good situation. So um, again, uh, best way to improve your cash uh, conversion cycle, there are three ways. Arrange for foster payments from customers. Give them incentives. Tell them, look, if you pay upfront, you may get be able to get some sort of a discount. Um, any way that you have to sort of encourage them for foster payments. Maybe you can do free deliveries um, if they if they pay up fast. All of those ways are ways to improve your liquidity. Um, secondly, the firm can work to reduce the production and sales cycle. So the faster your things are going to be made, the less wastage there is in your uh, production cycle. Um, the more lean it is, the more liquidity you will have. So if you're, um, you know, if it's taking like a year to make something, that means that all your investment is kind of caught up or stuck for one entire year, which is not a good idea. The third way is, you know, um, slow down payments that you have to make to suppliers. So maybe you can negotiate with your suppliers. I mean, globally nowadays payments to suppliers, you know, it's, it's uh, they're willing to give very good, um, you know, time frames for people to make their payments. So maybe you can reach out to your suppliers and request longer time to make payments. These are all good ways to improve the cash conversion cycle. Um, I did discuss this uh, with you. Um, if you want to know uh, how to calculate um, your, uh, sorry, cash conversion cycle, it is, uh, you know, the DIO plus the DSO minus uh, the DPO. And um, here in this situation, it's laid out over here. In, in, in this is just an example of one, two, three, four, five various companies. And here you see um, the cash conversion cycles uh, given. And you also see that, you know, all of these are, or at least most of these, four out of the five have negative cash conversion cycles. And, you know, what does that mean? Is that something bad or good? Well, it's something very good. Um, the lower the cash conversion cycle, especially if it's negative, the better the situation. Uh, this basically means that the company ha has... Um, you know, a lot of money on hand and maybe they even have money that they owe um, and it hasn't been spent yet. Um, and that's in their hand right now. So um, that, that's kind of a good situation for any company to have because, um, you know, this is, they can play with other people's money, they can invest it, they can use it to pay their own uh, builds all of that. So negative cash cycles are very good. The long cash cycles, the bigger the number of, you know, cash conversion cycle days, the the, the worse the situation. Um, if you really want to uh, sort of make, just have a look at Nestle. Well, um, here the days DPO or the days it's taking them to make payments to their suppliers is 147 days. That's a great terms. Those are excellent terms. That means that after they get the receipt, after the transaction is done, they have about, you know, five months to make the payment. Um, on the other hand, if you look at Unilever, um, they have a very, uh, and I'm looking at a different metric now, but they have a very fast uh, cycle time for production and sales. So, um, so right over here, the DIO, right? Talking about that. So that's one of the lowest compared to everybody else, just about a month, just a little shy of a uh, little bit over a month. And um, 
So again, it's very important to sort of understand that each of these um, you know, aspects, whether it's the receivables, the pay payables, the amount, the cycle time for production, and um, all of these factors play a very important role in um, determining how long the cash that you have on hand will last. So ultimately the cash conversion cycle basically means that this is the number of days you will be able to sort of function with the cash uh, that you you have. Again, the lower the number, the better it is. So, but just to give you a general idea, um, so it works a little bit backwards. Uh, you know, um, it's not like the longer um, you, the bigger the number, the better it is. But uh, you know, uh, if if it's if it's twenty eight point six. Um, you know, in, in Nasli's case, you have, you know, um, 30 days before which, you know, you're, you're set. You, for 30 days, you're set. You have, you will not be um, feeling any pinch on your cash flow cycle. Okay. So th that's basically, um, you know, some, some important facts for you to understand regarding cash conversion cycles and liquidity. So um, if I have to sum up uh, kind of what I've been talking to you about um, so far, uh, there's a couple of key points. The first one is that in general payment terms have increased uh, over a period of time, especially post 2008. And this is basically forcing um, suppliers to give longer, have longer payment cycles. And so this is causing all kinds of liquidity problems in various people's supply chains. So in order to deal with that, uh, this new term has been coined. Supply chain finance uh, has been, the meaning of it has, has been uh, changed in the recent past. And now it basically describes options that company have, companies have to finance their, their cash um, and, and, and basically increase their own liquidity. Uh, the cash conversion cycle is a useful illustration uh, for how companies can use their uh, capital. A negative cash conversion cycle is really good because this means that they can use other organizations' money to fund their operations. So um, this is these are some important points. Now, moving forward, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about how supply chain finance actually works how some of the <clears throat> most popular solutions in the market nowadays to provide supply chain finance. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about that. Um, so before I go into those details, uh, you know, just a quick overview for you. There are in, you know, two ways companies can get financing, um, either through debt or through equity. So if it's debt, that means they're going in the market, they're going to be getting some loans. Equity basically means uh, somebody is making an investment in the company, could be their shareholders, could be somebody else, but they're making an investment. They're not necessarily saying they have that money has to be paid back. Uh, most companies um, nowadays, uh, when you're talking about supply chain finance, um, you know, and, and increasing your liquidity, they usually are using debt. Um, they are taking loans uh, for to get them some liquidity. Very few companies are going and actually, you know, the other option is selling um, some sort of their goods or, um, sorry, their, their own property or equipment or something like that. So, um, people don't really want to do that for liquidity because if you're going to be going and selling things just for your liquidity position, um, you're not in a very uh, command kind of a situation. And the price that you can dictate from the market varies. Sometimes you will be able to get those goods at, at, at deep discounts. That's not good. Like if you had something that was priced at 100, but if you're in a rush for money, um, the other person may realize that you're in a rush for money and actually give you, um, instead of 100, maybe give you just 25, um, realizing that you're, you're, you're desperate. So you don't want to kind of be in that situation. Um, and, um, you know, but on the other hand, there are advantages and disadvantages of either one. Um, some people are very uncomfortable taking on debt. Um, they would rather just sort of live within their means. And um, if this means selling something, they would rather do that. So um, 
just just this is kind of a, a general overview for you. Now um, let's look at a, a normal transaction between a buyer and a seller. So in this example, um, it's a pretty simple example where raw material is being purchased uh, by a customer. And so a buyer um, kind of tells the supplier that they're ready to buy the, the goods, uh, the raw material. And so, um, you know, the product is, the, the, the transaction happens and the product is sent to the customer. And, um, you know, uh, basically before the transaction happens, the seller can, uh, you know, sorry, the buyer tells the seller that they will pay them an X number of days. Uh, and so the product is sent to the customer, they start using the product, but the, the amount of money that's going to be going back to the seller, they have to, the seller has to wait. Um, <clears throat> and how many days, it really depends. Um, if it's a short payment cycle or the X number of days, the decision between the buyer and seller is, look, I'll pay you in two days, that's great. But if they're willing to uh, pay the seller in 150 days, then the seller may be stuck. Uh, they may run into some sort of a liquidity issue and they may need to consider other options to get cash sooner. One of the methods to get cash sooner is called basic factoring, basic factoring. And uh, this is when, you know, again, the buyer is having to wait uh, for a very long time to get money from the, um, the seller is having to wait for a very long time to get the money from the buyer. So uh, they decide to sell the receivables to a third party, also known as a collection agency. Um, and this third party is basically known as a, the factor. Okay, so they sell the receivables to the factor. And the receivables is basically this kind of, uh, you can just imagine almost like, um, you know, uh, no, you know, some sort of a note or something saying that, look, um, this amount of money will be paid uh, directly to the factor from the buyer. Um, so the payment of the goods will be given to the collections agency, it will not be sent to the seller. So um, this is one way of, uh, you know, solving the liquidity problem that the supplier is, is, is facing. Now, there are two kinds of factoring that can be done. The first kind of factoring is factoring with recourse. And um, in this situation, if let's say, you know, the collection agency is waiting for the buyer to make them the payment and the payment is not coming, well, they can actually make a, go back to the seller and say, look, uh, we got this receivable from you. We had this arrangement, but the buyer is not being able to pay us. So uh, you will have to pay us. So, <clears throat> and that is factoring uh, with recourse. And the other one is factoring with, without recourse. And in factoring without recourse, um, the, the factor, basically the collection agency takes on the risk that the customer may not pay up. And so um, they charge a fee, they let the supplier know and they charge a fee for that, uh, taking on that risk, which is, um, you know, could be a bit of a, a it would be a higher uh, fee than uh, factoring with recourse. Um, and so they basically say, look, if, they, if it, we don't get the payment from the buyer, it's okay. We'll just absorb that. We'll take the hit. It's okay. So again, if you have, um, you know, with recourse, um, that's one option. Um, that is one option. But if you do have it without recourse, that is uh, yet another option. These are all options for um, supply chain financing, okay? So just in case you've gotten a little uh, confused about factoring with recourse and factoring without recourse, um, don't worry, I have in the next couple of slides, I will explain it again to you in a bit more detail. So let's look at this situation. Uh, this is a situation which is factoring with recourse. And uh, this is a situation where, again, um, there is a transaction between the you know, buyer and seller, and the buyer tells the seller, look, I'm going to tell, pay you, but I'm going to pay you in a, you know, maybe a very long period of time, let's say 150 days or something. The seller gets very concerned. The seller goes to um, a factor, also known as a collection agency, and says, look, 
I cannot wait for 150 days. Please, can you, uh, you know, just let, loan me the money for the short, for this 150 days. Whenever the buyer pays you, it will go directly to your account. But, and I'm willing to pay you a small, uh, a fee for this, for the, for the fact that you're ready to give me the money right now to use for 150 days. That fee is called the percent of invoice, okay? And so um, the collection agency says, you know, fine, uh, pay us this little fee and um, not an issue. I will, when we get it, we will, um, uh, we'll take the money. In the meantime, here you go. Here's the cash. You can start using it. Now, the percentage of discount um, is going to be kind of low in, in, in this case as compared to factoring without recourse. Why? Because in factoring with recourse, what happens is that if for some reason, after 150 days, the buyer does not pay up, the buyer says, oops, I'm sorry, I don't have the cash. Then the collection agency, also known as the factor, can go to the supplier and say, look, the customer has not paid up can you pay us back that money because we have not received it we loaned you that money but we have not received it and the supplier will say fine no issues here's the money sorry that that happened to you thank you very much for allowing us to use the money for 150 days uh, we will work with the buyer and figure out what happens right so that's basically what happens in factoring with recourse now let's look at factoring without recourse. In factoring without recourse, what happens is that the collection agency, again, it's the similar situation. There's a, there's a transaction between the buyer and seller. The buyer tells the seller, look, we're ready to pay you, but it's gonna take us a long time. The seller gets very worried because they have their money stuck. They go to a collection agency, also known as a factor. Um, they say, look, uh, we um, you know, want to have an agreement with you. We need the cash right now. We will pay you a percentage of invoice. Um, but the thing is, we don't really know the buyer very well. So um, we'll pay you a little bit extra. And can you keep the risk that the buyer may pay you or may not? So the factor will say, okay, fine, we'll keep the risk that the buyer may or may not pay us, but then you're gonna to have to pay us a higher percentage of invoice. And they say, sure, we will do that. So this is the main difference uh, between factoring with recourse and factoring without recourse. In factoring with recourse, there is less risk for the factor. Um, in factoring without recourse, there is more risk for the factor, therefore they charge a higher, um, price uh, for this service from the supplier. <clears throat> so um, factoring is a very common approach and it, it can, however, come at a very high cost because those people that are ready to pay you, lend you money, um, this is, you know, it can be a kind of a tricky situation. Uh, they may ask you for, for big, uh, sort of a penalty cost for, for that immediate liquidity that you want. There are some other options um, that are available to, for increasing liquidity. One of them is you loan or you sell your receivable. Um, you change the timings of payments. Um, you know, there are a number of, of things to keep in mind, which party is gonna bear the risk of repayment. Uh, you know, we just kind of saw that situation. If there's more risk of whether or not the payment is going to come, the price for giving you the li quick liquidity solution may be higher. Uh, you can use various types of collateral. So there's a number of, of, of options, you know, when you're talking about financing your receivables. Um, you know, basically you're, you're, you're talk, using your receivables to get some sort of liquidity or funds. And, and if, if you are going to be doing that, then um, there are a number of factors that play into the whole game. Um, you know, the amount of receivables you have, when the receivable is going to be collected, all of these kind of things. Each, whatever solution you decide to go with, it has a different impact on your networking capital. And um, one thing to also keep in mind is factoring uh, has a different impact on buyers and on sellers. 
um, and, and it means different things to different parties. So very important to sort of keep that in mind. Okay, moving forward now. Um, there are several benefits of supply chain finance. Um, if you are able to do supply chain, you are able to get that liquidity. Uh, you know, you, you have the ability to reduce the net operating working capital requirements. So, um, you know, again, basically, your working capital situation will get better if you are able to get supply chain financing. Um, sometimes uh, you can get lower material costs because maybe you have the funds on hand, you are able to pay up front, you can get bigger discounts, uh, you can have you know, lower operating costs. If you have working, um, you know, you have cash on hand, um, you know, you can, you can help sort of make your uh, cash cycles faster. Um, and net net, if you have you are in a liquid situation, you do have some cash on hand, you can basically develop a more robust supply chain. So there are um, these things that, that that do need you do need to keep in mind. If you do not have cash on hand, your supply chain in general will start going through a series of hiccups that can be very very costly. And for um, you know the third parties or the factors slash collection agencies, look, it's great to give supply chain financing. They really aren't doing any um, work per se. They're almost operating like a bank, and uh, or actually sometimes the factor could be a bank. And so um, it's 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 really a low risk kind of a situation in most cases, and um, they're able to make a lot of money off of it. So factoring is something that um, is seen quite positively uh, and is being done uh, quite, quite often nowadays by various companies. So next I'm going to uh, start talking to you a little bit about analyzing financial performance of companies. This is very important if you are working in a supply chain function and you are, um, you know, let's say a CEO or the head of a supply chain uh, and you are handed a, 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 you know, a set of reports, well, you do need to be able to decipher what is happening in the organization and uh, what is your cash cycle like? Um, are you in a healthy position, not in a healthy position? What's your cash conversion cycle? Um, and a number of other things. What is your cycle rate? I mean, there are so many different ratios that can be used for you to understand how healthy your company is. Um, will you be able to continue operations or are there any warning signs? So we'll be talking about all that and more in the next section. Now, what is the goal of a CEO? Let's start there. The goal of any chief executive officer is to provide shareholder value. And um, what, what is it that, that that helps increase shareholder value. Well, num number one, revenue growth. If you're going to be able to have, a, you know, a high amount of sales, that's going to be that's good news. Um, operating margin, keeping your expenses as low as possible, um, that's always a good situation. Finally, asset productivity. Whatever your assets are, whether it's your employees or your um, any sort of uh, equipment you have, making sure that you are using it as productively, as efficiently as possible. These are three things that really help increase the shareholder value. And interestingly, supply chain impacts all three of these. So um, supply chain is very, very crucial um, in the operations of any company. Most companies nowadays use a, something known as a balanced scorecard. You can kind of think of this almost like a report card. And um, this basically gives on a high level all the key, key factors. Um, and if you look at the balance scorecard, you can quickly decipher how well a company is doing. Um, it does talk about the revenue growth, the you know, productivity improvement, and the asset utilization. All of these key things, they're all highlighted on the scorecard. This is an example 
of what a scorecard uh, you know looks like. Uh, scorecards have many different designs, so uh, you know it's, this is not the only one. But um, here you can sort of see that uh, you know ultimately the end goal is improving shareholder value, um, and 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 basically in this kind of a report you can see all the various factors that are kind of leading into improving the shareholders value. Okay, now I'm going to start talking to you a little bit about ratio analysis. Um, this is very important from a supply chain point of view. You definitely want to be able to analyze uh, ratios and understand what they mean. Um, in general, um, in, in a ratio, there is a numerator and a denominator. Um, we also that so and comparison of the numerator to the denominator that is what gives you a ratio um in racial analysis you know before we go into it i just kind of want to mention that there are certain um items on the income statement others on the balance sheet um <clears throat> and you know kind of mixing and matching um these figures uh on the numerator and denominators sometimes lead to some interesting ratios that can really help uh, you understand how a company is operating. For example, if you want to understand how a company is performing overall, what the financial performance is, um, there are two uh, ratios one that you can use. The first one is return on equity, which is net income over equity. As you know, net income is going to come from the income statement. The equity figure is going to come, on the other hand, from the balance sheet. So that will give you, this figure will give you a good indication of the financial performance or the financial health of a company. The other um, interesting ratio is the return on assets. And this is calculated uh, with the formula net income over total assets. Again, the net income is coming from the income statement. The total assets figure is coming from the balance sheet. Um, this is going to give you the return on assets. Um, and again, this is a very good figure to help you understand how well the company is doing um, overall. Um, right, okay. So um, specific measures for financial performance, well, depends what you are wanting uh, to find. Um, I'm not going to go into every single one of these uh, formulas, but I do please note that um, you do need to be comfortable and able to calculate these. I will be giving you um, exercises that will help you get familiarized yourself with um, you know how to use these but um, long story short if you want to know what the revenue growth is uh, you can use these formulas the sales growth and the compound annual growth rate this will give you a good sense of what the revenue growth rate in general is um, if you want to know the operating margin um, the formulas you can use are the gross margin the operating margin and the net margin. And if you want to see how productive your assets are, you want to calculate the asset productivity. There's several formulas here, the asset turnover, inventory turnover, account receivable turnover, account payable turnover, and days of inventory outstanding. So these are some of the formulas. Um, again, these are three, three buckets, as, as mentioned, these are the three main things that CEOs are most, um, you know, uh, concerned about, and so these are formulas that can help that that help you get a good understanding of how each of these areas are are doing. So, um, all right, uh, now some racial analysis advice. Uh, there is no correct value for ratios, and ratios need to be understood in context. So basically, if there's a ratio for, for a company, you can't just take it at face value. You, you, you know, the best thing to do is compare it with industry averages, compare it with specific competitors, and look at what's been happening over a period of time. That will give you a very good indication of how your company is doing. Also, develop a framework of several ratios to monitor. Don't just depend on one ratio. Usually, in combination, these clues can help tell you a very interesting story. So looking at a ratio again, um, I'm just repeating, um, in isolation is never a good idea. 
Next, I'm going to talk to you about something that is known as the DuPont analysis. Um, the DuPont analysis is based on return on investment formula that was developed in um, 1914 by a DuPont explosive salesman by the name of Donaldson Brown and used by the company. Mr. Brown later used it as a CFO at General Motors, but it was, usually, it was already known as the DuPont formula. The DuPont formula is basically, um, it is, a, you know, a combination of two different ratios. So um, let's look at this. Uh, in the DuPont analysis, there is, um, you know, a, you have um, your, your, your net margin, you have to calculate the net margin, and you also have to calculate your asset turnover, and you multiply these. So you multiply, um, um you know your net margin multiplied by asset turnover okay all right um so next now before i go on to the next thing let me just mention one thing over here if you multiply the net margin with the asset turnover, what you will mention, you will, you will notice here is that the sales is going to be crossed out, and what you'll be left with is the net income over total um, assets. So it is pretty much the same as the return on assets. But the thing is, when you break it down like this, uh, according to the DuPont analysis, net margin into asset turnover, it shows you various different things, especially if you are looking at interpreting um, ratios. So this is something that is very much used um, to understand how uh, companies are doing. Um, and um, yeah, so that's it, it's sort of interesting how it works out. The DuPont um, analysis really assesses the operating margin and the asset productivity at a high level. So um, there is some sort of a trade-off between these two. If you're looking at um, the asset productivity, you're looking more at the turnover. If you're looking at the operating margin, you're looking at the pro profit. And you do notice that there is some sort of a trade-off trade happening at a high level between these two, the operating margin and the asset productivity. So um, next, um, another very interesting uh, ratio is uh, the GM ROI, which is also known as the gross margin return on investment. Now, this is also a combination of uh, two ratios, the gross margin into the inventory turnover. So the gross margin is gross profits divided by sales, and the inventory turnover is sales divided by inventory. If you cross the sales off um, from both of these, when you multiply them, you will be left with gross profit over inventory. Um, this is basically used when evaluating inventory decisions and their impact on profitability. Uh, the formula, so, so DuPont analysis, the formula commonly used today focuses on ROE. Um, so let's just take a closer look now. So if you want to use the DuPont analysis and you want to calculate the ROE, we kind of saw how to do that um, right over on this slide, net margin into asset turnover. But um, if you want to calculate the ROE, um, this is the formula for that. Again, this is actually a combination of three different uh, ratios. The net margin, which is net income over sales, into the asset turnover, which is sales divided by total assets, into total assets over equity. So um, this is a more complex kind of a formula. It has three elements versus two, um, just kind of to, to sort of uh, let you know. One thing to keep in mind is when a company takes on leverage or debt, um, there are various benefits because your liquidity position may increase. Um, that, as I mentioned, uh, helps you with your supply chain management. It adds value. But um, it's important to also mention that when you take on more debt, you're also increasing your risk. That is not a good situation. Um, the risk of being able to pay back um, is there, it's a very real risk. And the more debt you have, um, you know, your, your debt collectors are gonna be at your door asking for you to pay back. The question is, would you, will you be able to or not? 
And yes, sometimes, again, as I mentioned, um, if companies are not able to pay back, they run into cash flow problems, and sometimes they just have to actually shut down, which is um, rather unfortunate. Next, I'm going to be talking to you um, a little bit about um, ROIC, R-O-I-C. And this basically stands for return on invested capital. This is also some other, you know, this is another racial analysis that is used um, by companies. Um, so uh, we so far spoke a little bit about if you want to check the health of a company, you look at the ROA. You can look at the ROE. But what happens is sometimes uh, measures can be distorted by the amount of financial um, leverage that is taken. So if there's a lot of debt, that can cause um, problems um, for a company. Um, so these figures can just taken in isolation without sort of um, keeping the debt factor in mind can be a little deceiving. So that's why many companies do choose to calculate the return on invested capital. These are the returns on all capital uh, for investors seeking a return. It does not only include um, um, equity. So uh, one thing uh, to keep in mind, what does invested capital stand for? This stands for interest bearing debt plus equity. So um, that is a very important thing to keep in mind. There are more than one ways to calculate uh, the return on invested capital. One way is to calculate the NOPAT divided by invested capital. And what is NOPAT? It is um, uh, the earning before interest in tax multiplied by one minus the tax rate. That will give you what um, net operating profit after tax is. And um, so uh, you can have that, you can divide that by invested capital and invested capital, as I just mentioned, is your interest bearing debt. So this is usually long term debt plus equity. So uh, you take your uh, NOPAT divided by your um, invested capital and you can calculate uh, your uh, return on investment capital. So another way to calculate, um, actually, th that's the main, uh, sorry, this is the main way that I'm going to ask you to sort of uh, calculate the return on investment capital. Um, so again, uh, this uh, kind of is just an example. Um, it's, it's very easy. Uh, here, you, you just kind of plug and go on. So the EBIT over here would be 1,800. Um, and you multiply that by one minus whatever the tax rate is. As far as the interest bearing debt goes, um, I would look straight here at the long term debt, which is 4,800. Um, and I would add on, um, you know, the equity, which would be the common stock, 500 plus 1,400. So that's how you would calculate it. Um, another, um, you know, one of the last uh, uh, ratios I'll be talking about is the return on net assets. Uh, this is similar to the return on investment, invested capital. Um, and this is calculated by NOPAT divided by net assets. Um, as if you want to calculate your net assets, there are two ways of doing so. One way is fixed assets plus non-cash working capital. The other way is total assets minus current liabilities minus cash. And um, again, you can sort of look at this. Again, it's just plugging it in and moving forward. Um, so um, that's pretty much, uh, you know, what all I wanted to cover today. I'm going to kind of finish it off by um, just mentioning that the ROEC is a good measure for supply chain performance. Um, and it's, it is being used quite often by various firms. So that's quite a bit um, and a little daunting um, sometimes uh, for those that are, um, you know, nervous around numbers. But as I mentioned, I will be giving you some good um, exercises for you to get familiar with, um, you know, calculating uh, ratios and sort of interpreting them. Um, so with that, this lecture comes to an end. One of the key takeaways I hope you take from this is what supply chain finance is and the options that companies have to um, 
you know, finance uh, their supply chains, um, you know, and, and factoring with recourse, factoring without recourse, and also just a little bit about, you know, how financial statements, how you can use ratios to really understand how a company is performing, um, which is very, very important. Also, ratios should not be taken just in isolation. They should be compared and used as a benchmarking um, uh, in a benchmarking kind of a way. So thank you very much for your time. I uh, hope you enjoy this lecture and take good care.